Thank you very, very much for inviting me. I appreciate the hospitality. It's an honor to be here. I've learned so much about this area of the world. This is really my first time uh, being over here. Uh, and I'm going to talk to you from a 10,000 foot view uh, about the way I see resuscitation and the way we need to move forward. And hopefully, I'll tie together a number of the themes that you may have heard over the last uh, day and a half, uh, and then prime you to go out and effect some change on your own. And I'm going to talk about our program, Advanced Resuscitation Training, or ART, uh, as we call it. But I'm going to start by trying to convince you that we're at war here. Those of you in emergency medicine are used to talking about shifts uh, in terms of a battlefield and that you come out beaten up and uh, it really has sort of a negative connotation. I'm not sure why all the young people listen to that and want to go into emergency medicine. Um, but it's not the patients that we're at war with. It's a war against disease and it's ultimately a war against death. I like this quote uh, from one of our uh, journalists in uh, the United States. Healthcare is at its core about improving the odds of life and its struggle against death and extending that game which we will all lose, each and every one of us, into eternity, extending it another year or month or even a second. But in my 10,000 foot view, I'm a little bit embarrassed to say that right now we're losing this battle. And I look at all the young people out there and I think about when I was your age, which doesn't seem that long ago, and all of the people that I respected and trusted, that wasn't supposed to be funny. <laughs> all the people that I respected and trusted told me I'm wasting my time going into resuscitation. I'm going to get to the end of my career, look back, and things are going to be no different than they are when I started. And in fact, the evidence supports that. A recent publication by one of my colleagues, Camilla Sassan, 2010, looked at the world's literature in cardiac arrest, out of hospital cardiac arrest in the early 80s, 8.1%, and in the mid 2000s, 7.8%. Um, there was a brief spike in the 90s, and we've gone backwards since then. We used the American Heart Association Get With the Guidelines database to gauge in hospital cardiac arrest survival. And from 2010 to 2011, we backslid. What about the 2005 guidelines, which were supposed to be the renaissance and resuscitation, turned back to the classics, basic CPR, stay in the chest. This is a study from Rock that said the 2005 guidelines didn't affect outcomes at all. And these are some of the best EMS systems in the world. What about in San Diego? I'm up here because I must have something different to offer you, right? Well. In the 80s, this is our survival from cardiac arrest, BFib on the left, and all uh, treated arrests on the right. In the 90s, it looked like we were making some headway, started to put defibrillators out on the first responding units, and then we started to get fancy with paramedics and a lot of the ALS level of care, and we settled right back down to where we had been two decades earlier. And I got my start in trauma. In fact, my very first set of studies was the San Diego Paramedic RSI trial, giving paramedic succinylcholine, we were going to save the world from head injury, and outcomes again got worse, particularly good neurologic outcomes. So why am I up here? Well, I'm not sure actually. <laughs> but this is depressing. It looks like all my mentors were right, but I'm kind of wasting my time here. My attempts to change the world and, and save the world are actually backfiring and going backwards. So why are we all here? Well, we heard yesterday it's because it's hard, not because it's easy, but heck, if I'm sitting out there looking for what to do with my life, this isn't the model that I want to look at. This is a, a wasteland of, of damaged careers and broken dreams. <laughs> well, if you look closely, there are a few spots that give us some hope that you can affect change somehow. You see in the United States here, uh, we've got San Diego, Arizona, Seattle, up there in Minnesota. We've got some of the places that we've heard from on this trip to the, uh, this weekend, uh, some of the northern European countries that have produced better outcomes. And they come tell you about it, and you listen to what they say. And so what I'm going to try and do is tie it together, because we're trying to come up with a formula, uh, the secret formula for how you turn this around. And we're trying to, I'm trying to find a way to push this out to the entire world so that this is plug and play, this is easy. It's something that everyone 
should do or could do and, and ultimately, hopefully, has to do. So what's the secret formula? Well, by now you've heard enough people talk about their experience that this should look familiar. You've got to have a plan, you've got to collect data, uh, develop a toolkit, which includes both ways to interpret science, new technology, uh, training, and that's really where I fit into the picture, and ultimately create a cultural change. Now these are not real controversial things, they're kind of general, it's not real specific what I'm talking about here. And that's my challenge, is to make it specific so it does actually become a plug and play feature. But I'm going to talk about a couple of these things and how this has worked in San Diego and some of the other areas that I've been able to touch thus far. So what does it mean to develop a plan? Well, what I'm talking about here is a mixture of figure out how you're going to operationalize what you're going to do. And that can be incredibly complicated. And as you see, each country is its own unique um, challenge with regard to the political entities, the, the economic uh, the realities, uh, even some of the cultural uh, components of, of how you implement resuscitation plans. But for me, it started with something a little more tangible. Um, and that's the idea that we were going to try and prevent preventable deaths. We were going to try to keep people who weren't supposed to die from dying, or as we say in our motto, people should not die before they are done living. It's one of my moments of brilliance to coin that term. <laughs> this doesn't mean a whole lot to you yet, but we incorporate a whole lot of stuff and we take a lot of liberties. We don't just follow the prescriptions, but we think about stuff and we have uh, the gumption to be able to change things. And we started with the idea that it wasn't just about trying to resurrect dead people, although that's sexy and cool, but it was about other things too, keeping them from dying. It's not as satisfying to tell a guy as he's wheeled out of the hospital for discharge, I saved your life, and he thought, Are you sure you got the right guy? I've never you know, even had a, a palpitation, uh, much less a cardiac arrest. Uh, but we saved his life because he never got into trouble. We recognized something before it happened. And at the end of life, even being able to recognize futility and to tell that to a patient and family so that the end of life is smoother, that there's a smooth transition into whatever comes next, and that it's more palatable and more dignified, uh, ultimately. So we cast a very wide net as to what defines resuscitation as the world's largest umbrella. Um, and everything in the hospital I see as part of my jurisdiction now. Um, we talk about early sepsis, that's part of resuscitation. We talk about central line infection, sure. We talk about perioperative mortality from narcotics, definitely part of resuscitation. Every part of it, the palliative care, the end of life discussions, the decisions about monitors, I want all of it because it all affects whether we can prevent preventable deaths. Now, this may not look like anything you recognize, but this is from my home country, which is probably exactly through the center of the earth uh, from Colin. I think you know, if, if you drill the hole, you'd probably end up in San Diego. Uh, this is an enchilada. And this is the perfect analogy for how we see our program. I'm going to start to frame it for you here. Because an enchilada is a long thing, and it's pretty much the same in slices. Uh, so it's got a longitudinal component, but then it's made up of different ingredients. And on top is a big blob of guacamole. Uh, I live in the avocado capital of the world, Fallbrook, California. I have an avocado festival where you can eat avocado fudge and avocado ice cream. It's actually quite good. My wife makes avocado cake. <laughs> which is supposed to be yellow but looks a little green. Um, but this is our enchilada. It has a longitudinal component that looks at the path of a patient through the hospital from the moment of contact to the emergency department, screening, deciding where to admit, what kind of monitoring to do, early detection of deterioration, critical care, the resuscitation, the post-resuscitative care, even the end of life issues. That's a longitudinal look going down the enchilada. But it's got a number of ingredients. It's got inputs or afferents and outputs, efferents, things that we're using to make decisions, whether it's the published literature and things we're pulling from outside the institution, or it's our own database uh, that we're getting information from. And then stuff we do, launch special projects, change training, buy new equipment, whatever it takes to get the job done. And when you start filling in the details, you can see that this can get very complicated. And that's okay to have this level of complication uh, at the systems perspective. This is what we think about when we're in meetings and when I'm sitting at home and working. 
This can be what I think about when I'm trying to save someone's life. So our algorithms, conversely, are very simple. Um, they're things that you have to be able to remember. And I was really relieved to hear Colin say that kids are just small adults, or hospital adults are really just big kids, because they tend to have a stick seal arrest, you'll see in a second. Uh, because we combined our adult pediatric algorithms to make it more memorable for those of us who just don't see pediatric resuscitation very often. I started with this, which uh, in our class in, uh, on Friday, it turned out that you know, this joke sort of went over okay, even though um, you may not necessarily get the reference there for Clovis Interruptus. Um, but we started with the idea that the first iteration of the algorithm was when we focused on getting people to stay on the chest. We saw that as the number one goal of the program in its infancy. And we systematically went through all the things that interrupt compressions in a code, codus interruptus, and figured out what we were going to do about it. Was this a training issue? Was this something where we needed new technology? You'll see in the after session or in the, uh, the breakout session, if you, if you come listen about the technology, how we've solved a number of these things um, by looking for alternate technologies that allow us to, for instance, see the rhythm without stopping compressions or determine that somebody's had a return of circulation without stopping compressions. But always going back to the central theme, don't stop compressions. That's our most important weapon in this war against uh, uh, death. And our algorithm, which you won't be able to read in any detail from there, is built around that concept. It's built around ways to keep people thinking about what's really important. And it's built around the technology that allows us to continue to do compressions without stopping and still get the task done that we need to get done. The data collection, you know, that part may not be as appealing to you. You want to get in there and save lives. But once you start to see the data and the richness with what you can collect, it becomes fascinating. People love this part of it. What do we collect? There's some broad categories. We want to know stuff about the patient, what service they are on, where in the hospital they arrested. We've made a number of really interesting discoveries that I could talk to you for three days straight without stopping, probably literally, um, and tell you all the cool stuff that we're finding about patients in general and hospital patients in particular. Um, the events that happened upstream, what was happening right before they died, the antecedent events, the intra-arrest and post-arrest events, we collect data on that. Anything that happened during the code that maybe didn't go as well as it could have, the process issues, and then we do a clinical overread. And I'll show you how we do that here in what we call the matrix. We classify the events into the cause of the arrest, a little different than the overall cause of death. But we focus on why did they arrest, what physiologic process occurred right before they died. And that generates a number of things. First of all, it tells us that we need to collect some more data. Uh, because that category will tell us, for instance, if a guy is 400 pounds and uh, just got 3 milligrams of hydromorphone and is laying on his back after surgery, that's a very different situation that has a lot of implications about how we should have been monitoring him and what his cause of arrest was. Different than a guy who was having chest pain with ST elevations who flips into B-fib. So we want to know how they died and try and figure out were there things we could have done better beforehand to prevent it. And we always collect certain data from the code, which I'll show you, and then if they survive, the post-arrest data. And we put that all together in these big databases, and we analyze it, look for trends that help us decide to make changes in the algorithm, and I'll show you an example of that. Certainly it affects our training year over year. We change uh, what we emphasize and can go in completely different directions depending on who you are in the hospital um, and what year it is. We give feedback to individuals involved in the, the event itself, and then we may even launch some new initiatives. It's a basic feedback loop, a performance improvement loop. We call it CQI, Continuous Quality Improvement. That's what the CQI stands for. Um, so it's not anything brilliant. It just hadn't been done in this area before. So let's look at how this worked in our institution. This was our very first crack at looking at why people die in the hospital. Almost half of them have respiratory causes. That's why I say adults in the hospital are really just big kids because it looks more like pediatric resuscitation than it does the out-of-hospital defib arrest that we're used to focusing on through PCLS and BLS. There's a big chunk of sepsis and hemorrhage. There's a chunk of uh, BFib, VTAC. And we ask the question, which of these do we think we could prevent with things like training and rapid response? 
Didn't really think we could prevent B. Fib, so we left that one off the list. Um, but sepsis, hemorrhage, and respiratory stuff are fair game. Those are things we ought to be able to train, particularly the nursing staff, to recognize at the bedside and give them mechanisms to call for help. Um, and we'll see how we did in a second. What about the survival rates? Again, we broke it out into the different categories. And so you can see our V-fib arrest was pretty good at baseline. Didn't have any survivors for patients who had brain herniation syndromes, which you might not expect. Low survival for sepsis and hemorrhage. Not very good survival for respiratory. Um, patients with tracheostomies, vagal events, you can see in this category, in this uh, grid, we thought the opportunities were really to improve the response to patients having vagal events that lead to arrest, and then respiratory. Those were going to be our two targets. The data that we need for CPR come right out of the defibrillator, so that's an easy one now. And really, you have no excuse not to start exploring this and plan for it in the next fiscal cycle. Uh, because this is by far the most important thing we collect. It is the strongest correlation with outcomes that I'll show you if you attend the next session. Everything comes back to how good was the CPR. It's amazing. It was initially disappointing, but when you see the richness of data that you get now automatically, it's an incredible resource for doing research and really understanding how people are doing in your hospital. And we can present to you at any given moment how we're doing with regard to all of the important metrics. And again, you may look at that as kind of a, you know, esoteric research endeavor, but those things correlate very highly with outcome. The drugs that we're giving don't, who's running the code doesn't, um, but how they died and how the CPR was are the two things that affect outcome uh, in these patients. And so you've got to collect that data. We call it process issues uh, during the code. Things like, was the code leader good or bad? Uh, and it's a little bit of a he said, she said, and we thought, is this real data or not? Well, it turns out that this correlates very highly with ultimate survival to discharge, not with return of circulation. So this is not a selection or reporting bias. Uh, but it turns out when they've identified a poor leader or there's been a particular type of a process issue, uh, that that will predict a worse outcome ultimately, even if it's not apparent in the short term. And so we collect these. We also think this is valid because if we launch an intervention to boost up the code team leader, we started doing just-in-time training for the residents who are running codes, and suddenly code leadership issues disappeared in, those, in that group of uh, providers. The toolkit, so here you see a supermarket where you've got aisles and then you've got brands and different things in the aisle. So now we're going to change that aisle into that's your prevention aisle. You can go shopping for the different tools you need to prevent certain types of arrests. And here's your CPR aisle. Um, so you can shop for stuff if you're having problems with depth or recoil or whatever it might be. That's what I'm trying to create for you and for everyone is this modular curriculum where you just pick and choose. There are hundreds and hundreds of hours of things that you can teach to your providers each year, but nobody can afford that much training, so you've got to be selective. And the encouraging things is that, the thing is that it works, uh, that if you have the ability to grab what you need for each individual group within your hospital, not just everyone trained the same way, but the respiratory therapists trained differently than the critical care nurses, and the surgical ICU nurses trained different than the cardiac ICU nurses, and the cardiologists don't train at all. Well, actually, they train quite a bit uh, now because uh, they were embarrassed. And I'll show you the burns department in a second here, which is even worse. And all of it maps out. So all the data that we collect maps out to the stuff that we want to teach. And again, it has an impact. So let's see what the impact is. Here is the incidence of arrest and the different categories there. And you can see that, in general, the frequency of arrests, or the number of arrests, has gone down and that some of them have gone completely away. You can see as the lines get closer together, uh, that indicates that we've been effective in those areas, particularly respiratory, particularly sepsis and hemorrhage. Uh, it's almost nearly disappeared. We'll talk about the science and technology, but that's how we influence our algorithm, like I already talked about. Um, but that ultimately plays out in arrest survival. So, Let's see how we did. Vagal events suddenly are up from 0 to 50% survival. Hemorrhage from 10 to 66% survival. Respiratory is up. Tracheostomy related deaths. Still didn't have any effect on neuro and sepsis, which we didn't expect. But uh-oh, there's a problem here. 
Do you see it? Now we wouldn't have seen it because overall survival was up that year. But when you look at it this way, it's like, holy cow, what happened to V-Fib? It fell fivefold when we adopted the one shock at a time, two minutes of CPR between shocks, like we were supposed to. And so we went back then and trained differently and went back to stack shocks. And look what happened. Now the survival, oh, not the minutes, <laughs> it was supposed to be uh, percentages. Um, now the survival is even higher than it was at baseline. We certainly corrected that drop and then we've continued to rise in most of the other areas. This is how the system works. If you have that type of a dashboard where you can see things like that, even when overall things seem to be doing okay, you can identify an opportunity that you didn't see before because of the way you keep your data. And it doesn't take that long. And ultimately, this is what you want. You want your staff, you want everyone to buy into this. And it's kind of a nebulous concept. Um, and these are the things I believe are important. The, the folks have to feel like it's relevant to them. The cardiologists have to feel like you're telling them information that they need and that they're hearing it from somebody who's credible. So we have critical care faculty teaching these classes. We have code nurses teaching these classes. These are not instructors that you know, never touched patients before, which is who was teaching us CPR before. These are the top people in the hospital who have access to the data, who go to con conferences, who do research, who are teaching the classes. In the hospital, everyone has both ownership, they're fiercely proud of this, but they're also accountable. They know that we're watching everything they do, and they don't want to be on our radar screen. And so there's that balance between ownership and accountability, but ultimately that helps the buy-in. And particularly for nursing, where's our nurses here? This is a very nurse-intense program. They get ownership. So again, they're held accountable. But this is their program, and they are recognized for it because they're at the front lines. And that's a little bitter pill for the docs to swallow. We want them to be thinking in a broader sense of what should be the directions we take as an institution. But unless you're willing to sit there by the bedside 24-7, you need to go to the source. And that's one of the major changes that we made. This is the kind of thing that people would get after a code. A lot of this just spits out automatically from the defibrillator but it's a report card as to how you did. And we know that we've engaged people because bystander CPR, it's a metric that you can use as an indicator of your cultural buy-in, went from about two-thirds of the time to now we've actually had a couple years in a row where we haven't had a single case where the code team had to start compressions, which is what I mean by bystander CPR. And one thing that I can't necessarily tell you how to create but be on the lookout for. When you're trying to implement something new, look for a sentinel case. This could be a really good case or it could be a really bad case, but something that's going to give an emotional response and help people understand what you're trying to do. So I'm going to show you the case that turned it around for me and for what we were trying to do. And I happened to be the one treating this particular patient. Four in the afternoon, my shift was over in an hour on a Friday. Uh, Code Blue Medical Specialties Clinic. It's an outpatient area, uh, but we cover it because it's in the main hospital. 30-year-old girl lying where her own chair normally sits, lying on her back, um, had just started gasping, and co-workers called for a Code Blue. We come in and she's being bagged by a pulmonary critical care attending and his fellow, but there's no compressions going on. Asked the question, does she have a pulse? He said, no. Well, she was good in compressions. And this is around 2007, so compression, I'm glad you're all laughing, but uh, back then, compressions as the king was sort of a new concept. It's like, no, ABCs, airway, breathing, circulation. Where's anesthesia? We've got to get her intubated first. Doesn't have an ID, there's no crash cart. And oh, by the way, every one of her colleagues wants us to know that she's 21 weeks pregnant. So 12 minutes, 45 seconds into her collapse, well actually about a minute, minute and a half before that, the compression started. We finally get her on a monitor at this point, and she's in what appears to be the fib. So we take the first shock, and nothing changes. Now we're still going every couple of minutes, and that's still what we would do now for somebody who had gone you know, 12 minutes without compressions. So two minutes later, still in the fib, take another crack at it, and no change. A 
about two minutes later, I'm having a little bit of trouble estimating, so I'm shaking like a leaf at this point. Um, looks like she's still in a shock low rhythm. We take another shock, nothing. We get her intubated, and through this whole thing, she's got her eyes open, kind of roving back and forth. In fact, when we started compressions, the pulmonary critical care attending went off to the corner and said, I guess I'm not in charge anymore, kind of was sulking. And then he saw her open her eyes and looked like she was trying to breathe. So wait, I think she's awake. And I said, yeah, but she's in the fib. So we went back to the corner. <laughs> but it was eerie, because we had never seen this before. And I'm sure you've heard cases now. Now this became important in combination for what happened next. Fourth shock still looks like shockable rhythm. And we shock into about two or three organized complexes and then right back into the fib. Now at that moment, a perinatologist showed up. That's a side effect of being in an academic center. They can call a perinatologist if you can get there and ask the question that we didn't want to hear. Is it time to do a C-section? Is this a perimortem C-section? And he's asking me, and I'm thinking, well, you're the perinatologist. <laughs> I wouldn't do it. We're not even in a, you know, that's not our neonatal hospital. I would certainly not do it on a 21-weeker who, you know, that's sort of touch and go even in a good you know, in a perinatology hospital, much less lying in an office. Um, but he asked the question, and so I figured the right answer was probably yes, except I almost thought if I said that, that she was going to scowl and shake her fist at me, because she's still got her eyes open and she's trying to breathe. And so I said, not yet, and I could hear myself say it like I'm off on the side thinking, idiot, what's yet? How do you make a decision like that? because I'm not quite ready to give up on the mom, um, but at the same time, this kid's still got a chance, maybe, or does the first 12 minutes of nothing essentially seal the kid's fate, too? So we go on to a fifth shot, a shock. You can see my timer will still two minutes there. Um, again, a couple beats and then nothing, right back to defib. At this point, I'm getting so antsy that what felt like an hour was only a minute and 15 seconds. I'm not keeping very good track, but let's do it again because I want something to happen to give me an answer, and boom, she has return of circulation. Now, that was an understatement. She was like a caged animal, wide awake, taking swings at us. We would all leap in and try and grab her arms because she was trying to get to her tube. She would throw a punch and knock someone in the jaw. We would all fall backwards in unison. She would grab her tube. It was amazing to see. And finally, the pulmonary critical care guy stepped up, got a central line, gave her some Versed, and finally she's calm. Now she's writing on a piece of paper, um, when can I get this tube out? You're within minutes of this arrest. In fact, the cardiologist challenged us. I don't think she was ever dead. And so I had literally 30 feet of rhythm strips that I had fished out of the garbage um, to show them that she was yeah, actually, other than a couple of beats through here, she was in V-fib that whole time. Now, at this point, you know, there's a train of people accompanying her up to the ICU. All of her colleagues are sitting crying, and everyone's kind of following this train. Um, and they are convinced she must have thrown a PE. So they're doing an echo, looking for right heart strain. We're getting the MRI warmed up, um, talking to the perinatologist, and I'm asking him, you know, what are the chances that a pregnancy would survive? what was 20, almost 24 minutes of death. He said, well, actually, he'd never even seen a mom survive, so he didn't think that the baby was going to survive. Um, we borrowed the echo, and here's this kid moving around in there like nothing ever happened, um, has a normal heart rate. And he said, don't get too excited. This is such a major insult, she's probably going to abort. And so they admitted her to the hospital. She didn't have a PE. Turned out she had an underlying prolonged QT syndrome. Uh, she ended up getting a pacemaker. She was in the hospital for a couple of weeks, and the baby was growing like nothing had ever happened. <laughs> and I kind of forgot about it and was at a conference on the East Coast, and I got a page from the same resident who had been there, that code, saying, hey, you know who just delivered? I was trying to think of who we knew that was pregnant. And for about six months, I called it a baby boy. And then she actually came, the mom, to one of my lectures. Um, and she's bawling and I'm bawling and the whole thing's a mess, but she corrected me, it's actually a baby girl. <laughs> That's the sister, so every year I get her Walmart photo stream. So, 
That's the most recent one. Uh, so that was the case I needed to get traction in the hospital. I had the old pulmonary guy, ABCs, and then you had me coming in, no, uh, just do compressions and keep going. Um, the net effect, as you can probably guess by our outcome data, we've had a drop in non ICU arrests, a rise in arrest survival where we're pushing 50%. There's the US benchmark. We've pushed this out into the field, but our overall hospital mortality has dropped about 20%. We've pushed it out in the field and we're seeing the best outcomes that we've seen anywhere. Um, you can see our current benchmarks down there. We've put it in the helicopters. We've even applied it to something as specific as endotracheal intubation and seen very similar results. And if you stop the program, it goes away. Our emergency physicians used the ASEP rule that said, hey, emergency physicians don't have to take ACLS anymore. So they don't have to take art either. I just showed them this data about a month ago, and so I'm waiting for the backlash to stop. Um, but it works while you're doing the training, and when you stop the training, it goes away. You need to keep practicing, just as Colin said before me. That's for ED rest, here's for CPR, arrival, same pattern. So to conclude, there is huge opportunity out there. We've saved over 500 lives in a very short period of time in one hospital. This could be replicated around the world. This would be a game changer. You need to take an organized approach to everything, including data analysis, the training, and ultimately, as I'll show you in the next session, there's even ways to integrate new technology, always going back to your institutional algorithm and trying to keep people from dying before they're done living. Thank you very much for your attention.